Gospel of Matthew, <coughs> excuse me, chapter 24. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24. <coughs> All this clearing of my throat, I've, I've realized, most of you know that I make a lot of coughing noises and all that for about the first 10 minutes and then it clears up usually. So I, I was thinking about it. I thought, you know what I should do is like for the first 10 minutes, just share worthless information. You know, like the, the life expectancy of a snail is like three months. Did you know that? I know, then it's, actually I just made that up. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think a fly is only a couple of weeks if I'm not mistaken, but <coughs> see. All right, Matthew 24, and we're going to look at verse 9, <coughs> but we're also going to remember that what we're doing is we're going through and we're seeing um, I don't know if everyone realizes this, but all these scriptures that we've been going through, we have pretty much only dealt with the scriptures that flat out said the kingdom. Okay. And amazingly, they all keep <coughs> sort of flowing in the same direction, which is Christ crucified. Here's our list. <coughs> you have Claudia. John's whooping it up over here. Glad to have you here, Claudia. <coughs> Sharon, Sharon, I got your email, and I loved your answers. Uh, and along that line, we, <coughs> we talked about homework. And um, <coughs> some of our students inquired whether we were going to take it up tonight. Yes, I wanted to give you that answer. Well, it makes it exciting. You never know what's going to happen. <coughs> we have uh, Cassie, which I just left, so I don't know how she got on there so quick. Uh, Mallory, Mallory, I hope you're feeling better, and I'm sorry if that singing thing last night messed up your throat more, but that's kind of the way I treat people. I'm pretty bad. <coughs> And Carolyn Harris, Scott's mom, good to have you with us tonight. And Doug Fisher, Doug and I talked for how long, Doug? We talked for quite a while today. <coughs> and Mary. Hi, Mary. Good to have you with us. All right. Um, and... and the, uh, <clears throat> the emphasis has been not just by finding scriptures that talk about the kingdom, because that's not hard to do. The emphasis has been to discover what, con to, to discover consistently in those scriptures, what is the subject that they're trying to bring out just within the realm of those scriptures. Okay. <clears throat> and what we've discovered already is that it is presenting the kingdom, <clears throat> uh, first of all, either as Christ living how he lives, because he's demonstrating the kingdom, or, or what is the information surrounding his teaching about the kingdom, or what will be, and in this case, prophetically fulfilled in relationship to the kingdom. <clears throat> and in all of those different angles, the one thing that is consistent is that the kingdom represents the nature of the king governing us. But when you say the nature of the king, we're talking about the person who sits on the throne, aren't we? And when you look at the nature of the person on the throne, what do you see? Lamb of God. Right? Because that's not 
demonstrating king when you see a lamb sitting there, but what's sitting on the throne is the king. But what you're seeing is the nature of the one when you see lamb. <clears throat> and, you know, he may have crowns and all that kind of stuff, but his nature, his nature <clears throat> involves selflessness. It, it involves literally losing uh, that others may gain. Now, again, we've discussed that. We would be glad to die, give ourself, you know, either physically die or give ourself uh, for someone we cared about. Oh, I will lose that they gain. You know what I'm saying? Um, one of our loved ones <clears throat> has a kidney problem and they need, they need a donor. Well, I would gladly give my kidney so that they would have a good one, you know and I'll lose so that they will gain. <clears throat> well, that's not unusual in the, even in the world. People do that all the time. They don't need Jesus to do that for people they love. But would you do it for somebody who is out to get you, and it, what if they were a tremendous perse persecutor of you, and that they <clears throat> wielded a lot of power and influence, and had a big audience, and were continually making your life miserable, and then all of a sudden they went down and they were going to die if they didn't get a kidney or something like that, would you then, if you were a match, would you then be willing to give them a kidney? <clears throat> well, we go through all sorts of stuff, don't we? We don't just see, well, here's a person in need, and you know, I'll do it. We say, you know what, this is the Lord that they're going to die. I'm not going to give them my kidney. They're supposed to die because they're evil and they've been persecuting me. That's what makes them evil, if they persecute me. You see what I'm saying? I mean, that's not true. I'm just saying that's how we, we think. <clears throat> that's called sarcasm. Um, but... <clears throat> But maybe we would weigh it and we would go, you know, if I do give them a kidney, <clears throat> I can be assured of continued years of oppression and of putting stuff out there in such a manner that's just going to make my life miserable, that's going to affect my family, that's going to affect my ministry and everything else. <clears throat> and, uh, and it's easy to justify you know, this is the Lord, and he's getting back at them. And, of course, <clears throat> I don't want to go into it now because I've done it in other classes, but punishment has been settled at Calvary. Jesus bore our punishment for what we've done wrong. You know. <clears throat> um and so you get in the situation and you go, this, this could ruin my life to do this. But then you ask yourself, um, is, is it Christ? And you find out that it would be Christ in you to, to do whatever. You know, I'm just giving you an example. <clears throat> to your own loss, but to bless those that curse you to bless those who despitefully use you, to cover them, to give your enemy a cold glass of water um, when, when it's really hot. <clears throat> and you, you would be surprised how much your mind plays in decisions like that instead of another life. You know, Jesus. I mean, Jesus. I mean, we all, let's just admit it now. We all want more of Jesus coming out of us, right? We would all say that in church, you know, particularly in church or Bible school. You say, oh, yes, I, you know, you get in that environment and everything. But we're talking about, when we talk about it, we're talking about he must increase and we must decrease. Are you ready for the decrease with Christ coming forth through you? I mean, you know, I don't know what we've envisioned. I don't know what we envision when we say he must increase and I must decrease. <clears throat> but for him to increase, 
would be to reach out to this person, your enemy, to, to, to uh, uh, use our example, supply them with one of your kidneys. <clears throat> and, it, and it's going to cause a decrease to you, not just one less kidney, but continued years of agony. Okay. Uh, that would be a decrease of you. Could you take it? Would you want it? No, I don't want it. But do you want Christ to come out of you? Uh, well, yeah, yes, but what I mean is I want to, you know, when, when I'm sitting in a nice chair during the service and someone comes in, a visitor, and I go, oh, here, take my chair. That's what, that's what I mean. I want Jesus to come out. Really, that's it, huh? You know, I mean... Compare, you know, the disciples and how they ended their lives and compare all of the people you admire in the scriptures and they did a little more than give someone their chair, you know. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> Our scriptures, Matthew 24, verse 9. We're going to read 9 through 14. <clears throat> then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you should be hated of all nations for my name's sake. <clears throat> and then shall many be offended, many of us, because of this sort of thing. Then shall many of us be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall arise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall grow cold. But he that it shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. <clears throat> and this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Okay, so the end, <clears throat> the end is not um, uh, all the things that we think are going to bring about what we call the end. <clears throat> the end and the aim of God is for the gospel to be preached and for those who will receive Christ as life, as nature, as king over their reactions, their attitudes, and their motives. Once it's gone out, people make the decision, some of them right off, some of them later. Okay, when, when that's gone <coughs> out, and people have basically made up their mind if they're going to be a sheep or a goat, well, that's it. He's not, you know, it's, he's not, I don't know. I don't even know how to think anymore <laughs> of the other things that everyone makes being the end. But this is what it's talking about. <clears throat> and uh, you see these, uh, these things that are happening here. <clears throat> To believers, we say to believers, and we say, well, this is, <clears throat> this is the stuff that's going to happen in the end time. But these things happened to Jesus, and it was his end time, mm -hmm. and to Paul, and it was his end time, and on and on and on. Can I get amen on that? I mean, this, is, this, this isn't reserved for, <laughs> you know. I mean, Jesus has hated it in all nations. And... <clears throat> It's not reserved for a specific time in that sense. It is reserved for those who are related to the gospel of the kingdom or the self-giving one. Okay. And what are they doing? It doesn't say, and, and these shall be, <clears throat> like verse 9 again, uh, um, then shall they deliver you to be afflicted and shall, you know, 
Okay, so they shall deliver you to, to be afflicted, but God shall deliver you. No, the next word says, and they shall kill you. They shall deliver you to be afflicted, and you shall stand up with the sword of God and take their heads off, because we will overcome. Mm, no. No, like Paul. Okay, Paul's a good example. And he was in prison in Rome, and he was going to demonstrate to all the Romans that this God is the real God. And so he took a, someone slipped a sword in the cell, and he broke out, and he cut off all the heads of all. No, they cut his head off. What kind of victory is that, Brother Paul? You started out so well. You started out doing such great and wonderful things, and you end like that, the same way Jesus did, and every true man of God or woman of God. <clears throat> yeah. Because, what is that old saying? The blood of the martyrs is the seeds of the, of the church. Um, <clears throat> you could put it another way. Life comes out of death. You put it another way, this isn't end time talk. This is today talk and tomorrow and every day because it is the kingdom governing these people. You see, Jesus, he doesn't have to say, well, <clears throat> this happens like in a 30-day period. No, I know we read a bunch of that into it, but <clears throat> this is the kingdom. This is the way of the kingdom, okay? And they shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And, and let me tell you, that, that scripture runs through my mind a lot because <clears throat> I travel to a lot of nations, and, and the average thinking is um, I want to be respected in all nations, and I want to be admired for my stand for the Lord. But Paul, by and large, even when he was in prison, wasn't admired for his stand. He said, everyone has forsaken me and only Luke is with me. You know, it's like, dude, you're losing ground here. I mean, that's the way people think. It is the way people think. I know that. Christians, it's the way they think. <clears throat> And what if Paul actually understood the gospel of the kingdom? And he understood, look, this thing's got to go around the world. This thing has got to affect lives. And it takes a life to get a life. And I'm going to lay down my life. And, and, uh, I, and I'm going to do it by Christ. And I'm going to do it knowing that if there's a death by Christ, there's a resurrection. Because we say life comes out of death. Life doesn't come out of any death. It comes out of his death. It comes out of his self-giving. And Paul understood that. He said... He said, you know, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might come forth in you. That, that's his, you know, can we call it, that's his weird way of thinking, and yet that's Bible, folks. That's Bible. And you say, well, you're twisting the scripture. How in the world can you twist that? Just the one I just quoted. How do you twist that scripture? It says what it says. I mean, I mean, you know, <clears throat> and, and along with that, you say, well, you know, um, there were people in the Bible that, yeah, God, you know, you see that in Hebrews 11. There were those who, who defeated armies and did this and did that, and then about halfway through, and, and then it goes, and yet there were others who, wanting a greater resurrection, didn't resist, but accepted a deeper death, <clears throat> uh, and on and on. I mean, it goes on. <clears throat> um, and even many of the victories, I mean, you know, and what shall we say of Samson and of da-da-da-da? Well, let's see. What will we say of Samson? Uh, he gave his life. He pulled down the thing. He brought down more Philistines than he had killed in his personal strength, warring and fighting and taking jawbone of an ass and killing. He defeated the princes of the Philistines all in one moment, pushed down the thing, and it all caved in. Does that sound like anything you've ever heard? Like the gospel? Like 
Jesus dying on the cross? But, but, we go, but we read it and we go, and what shall we say of sin? So, yeah, you know. Well, <clears throat> and I say, well, you know, how do people miss this? Well, I know how they miss it. I, you know, I know how they miss it because it is inherent in man, and especially men, to fight and to war and to get victory. And this is why we go to movies and we see these movies and they're, and we, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I really do not mean to pick on Braveheart. I can't think of another movie. That, I mean, they're full of it, you know. <clears throat> um, but even in Braveheart, he died at the last, and, there, and the thing that, is, that impresses the people was that he gave his life for this, so let's rise up, you know. Um, <clears throat> and it's just a shadow of, of rising up in Christ, though, and an increase of Christ, and a, and a one seed falling into the ground and die to bring forth a whole bunch of seeds, so what? They can live their happy lives? No, so they can fall into the ground and die and end up with a harvest of dying seeds. I mean, that's, you know, we're all praying for the harvest. Oh, oh I want the harvest, you know, I want God to bring in, I want him to have his harvest, you know. And so we think the harvest is going out there and telling them about Jesus. Well, that would be the equivalent of, you know, we think that's it. That's the harvest. Let's go out and witness to them. And they receive the seed. Folks, the ground receiving the seed is not the harvest. That's just the beginning. It's that how, it, there's a long process that takes and grows. And then it, all that was planted has to grow and then die, and bring forth and you know, <clears throat> and so I say that, you know, I understand people don't get this because it's not inherent in man to get this. It is just the opposite of what is inherent in, in us. And our thinking is, is it's, it's the wisdom of this world. God's thinking is hidden wisdom. And if you search that out, you look it up in Corinthians and you really study it, it's the wisdom of the cross. It is. It, I mean, I don't, that's not twisting anything either. It is the wisdom of the cross, the foolishness of God coming down here. And instead of destroying and winning and beating like that, he died and he took what all them mean people deserved. It's hidden wisdom and it's foolishness. But it is the mind of Christ. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. It is his mind. So he, he, so he doesn't say, well, be, just be Christians, but, but be Braveheart Christians. No, he doesn't say that. He says, stop being Braveheart Christians and let this mind be in you. You know, to... But how, how are we going to do that? We're, we're not going to do that naturally. We, we, there is nothing in us that can. We can actually download all of the doctrines and teaching of what I'm saying or what Paul's saying or anybody else along this line. It doesn't have to be me. Uh, we can just, you know, soak it in until we have the doctrine of it. But I'll tell you what, as soon as you get in a situation where, you're, where it's unfair or something like that, you'll respond with the old. Unless, of course, unless, I mean, there's hope. <laughs> but it is that we go, that, that in this we go, you know, my spirit is bearing witness that this is the Lord. And uh, uh, I need this and I don't need to concentrate on figuring it out. I need to cry out. And I need to say, Holy Spirit, and here's what I always pray, if this is of you, if this is of you, if this is you, then work it into the every fiber of my being. Work Christ into me so that there is an increase and a decrease. All right. So, so these guys get out there. And, and I mean, you know, we look, this is all seen as the end time. So if this is the end time, it doesn't look too good. 
I mean, here's, here's the end time. Uh, then they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then many, shall, many among you shall be offended, and they'll betray one another, and they're going to hate too, you know. They're going to hate one another, so they're going to be like the ones who hated you. <coughs> and many false prophets shall arise and deceive many, and, and uh, the love of many shall grow cold. What kind of victory does that sound like? Does that sound like the way to end the story? I mean, you know, well, you know, the devil says, I won, I killed them all. Did the devil ever win by killing any of us? No. No. <clears throat> now, let me make something clear as I reach for my drink. By the way, this is new Welch's 100% no. Sorry. Yep. <clears throat> We're not talking about preparing yourself for people to to kill you. That may happen, but that's really not what we're talking about. We're talking about <clears throat> Being able, I mean, if you can't, if you don't take care of the little things, God's not going to give unto you the bigger things. If you're not faithful in that which is least, you're not going to be faithful in that which is more than that. So he's saying in everyday circumstances, in little things, what we've many times around here call little altars, Go to that altar. Die to yourself and let someone else win. And you say, okay, well, what's the point of that? Because every time I do that, this particular person always takes it and they think they're smart and they think they're so good because they win and I'm always losing. And, you know, and then that other mind starts kicking in and we start going, when am I going to win? Well, you just did when you laid down your life. That's winning. Jesus said that. <clears throat> if you seek to save, you're a loser. But if you lose for my sake, that is winning. So we're not talking about the horrendousness of this picture at this point. I mean, it may end that way. It may end that way for my life. Yay. <laughs> I'm not afraid of that. I'm afraid of being so selfish that God would never put me in a situation like that. That scares me. That scares me. I'm glad you're not scared or don't. Well, I'm just telling you, you know. <clears throat> it's that kind of talk that will cause all nations to hate you. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, so all these things are happening for one reason. It is a rejection of the gospel of the kingdom. This message shall be preached and they're going to be rejected for it. That's why it's happening. <clears throat> and these lambs are the crucified and the people doing it, rejecting that mindset, that spirit, that mind of Christ are the crucifiers. Let's go to chapter 25, verse 1. <clears throat> then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins who took their, their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. <clears throat> All right, so <clears throat> this oil, if you'll, if you'll consider, how about we... It's not in my notes, but how about we, we look at it like uh, the golden candlestick in, in the uh, holy place in the tabernacle. Okay, that golden cam candlestick had seven branches, seven representing completion. The middle one on it, and if some of you know what, it's not really the menorah, it's a seven-branch candlestick, but we know what a menorah looks like, which is another 
candlestick altogether. <clears throat> it all comes to an equal level, but in, but in the, the golden candlestick, the middle one was taller and stood taller than the rest. And basically what it was is it did, we call it a candlestick, but it actually wasn't like little holes where you put candles in it. It was, it was a vessel, it was a shell, it was, a, it, it was made like all tubes, and you put oil in there, and then you set a wick on it, and the wick went into the oil, and that's what burned, okay? <clears throat> so the inside of that, and we've always said, well, the seven-branch candlestick represents the church, because you see that over in the book of Revelation, which, you know, I think is a huge picture of the seven branch candlestick with Jesus in the midst of the seven churches. Okay. Well, what's in the midst of the seven churches? What's in the midst of the seven branch candlestick? This oil. And I believe that represents the true essence of what the Lord is, of what God is, whether spirit or Jesus or father, the essence of what he is and that's what's lit in us. You know, it says, Jesus, you're the light of the world. But later on, he says to us, you're the light of the world. And we go, no, 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 we're the light bearers, you know what I mean? Because we're not the light of the world, trust me. I'm just looking around the room, and it's freaking me out, okay? <clears throat> you know, it's, um, he's the light of the world. But we are his, his light bearers. And so, so someone could look at, it, at that and say, that's the only light, true light. This is the true light that has come into the world, the light of life. And that light is in us, the light of life. <clears throat> All right, so that oil <clears throat> in that seven-branch candlestick represents the essence of God. So these, these ten virgins will, you know, this says five were wise and five were foolish. Well, there's a hidden wisdom. Five were God-wise. They were hidden wisdom wise. Okay? <clears throat> Five were foolish. They had everything but the true essence of it. So when, when the bridegroom showed up, they didn't have their lamps full. They said, well, we, we got the vessel. Yeah, but where, where's the inside stuff? You know? I mean, it, it's kind of like being given a Twinkie and you eat, bite into it and you can't find the inside stuff, you know? <laughs> you know? What happened here? <clears throat> well, that's what Jesus did when he came back. <laughs> he said, we're missing the inside stuff, the good stuff, the creamy filling. <clears throat> so, so when the bridegroom returns, this is not the time to start trying to get hold of the essence of the kingdom. That's not the time to start trying to get a hold of the essence of the kingdom. Um, and this, this thing that we're talking about, like what was in 24, about coming to the place where they were at there, that takes time. It takes, it takes um, experience. It takes uh, decision-making in circumstances that start small like David first with the bear and then with the lion and then with Goliath, you grow in your ability to, to let Christ come forth in you instead of automatically rising up and going, oh, I've got my rights and this is wrong. And you know what I mean? Going through all of that, those gyrations that are not the Lord. <clears throat> I mean, the spirit of it isn't the Lord, is it? Where, where does that, you know, that spirit is being inflamed by circumstances instead of Christ being the flame. <clears throat> and so um, it, it really does. It takes time to develop this. And so the time to start thinking about, well, I need the essence of this thing is not when the bridegroom shows up. You need to have been prepared and working on this and flowing with the Lord in it and hearing the Holy Spirit and, and recognizing your reaction and then going, you know what? That's not the Lord, and I am not a hypocrite. I want the Lord. I do want the Lord, and I'm going to, you know, if you're going to fight against something, fight against yourself. You know what I mean. React against yourself. Just don't, you know, just, well, they're wrong. You know, I can't remember how the saying goes, but... It's an old saying, and, and, and it is, uh, 
<clears throat> when you get up in the morning, uh, the first person you meet, now this, this word I'm going to use is not the actual word that goes with it. If you get up in the morning and the first person you meet is a jerk, then they're probably the problem. It says, if you, if you go throughout your day and everyone you meet is a jerk, then you're probably the problem. All right, let's go to verse 14. <clears throat> By the way, I didn't read uh, all of the, the uh, ten virgin one because we have so little time. <laughs> so you can go back and read it and see it in relationship to the kingdom. <clears throat> verse 14, for the kingdom of heaven, and notice the words, well, let's just go. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and you know the rest of it, the, the talents and the <clears throat> giving of that. Um, and if we're going to make any progress, because I'm losing time here, I might should just read some of these. <clears throat> Jesus gave his goods to his servants. If you lose you gain. If you give, you get more. There are those who do not live according to the kingdom here. <clears throat> so he gave, he gave of what was his substance to them. And one, you know, went and he used it. He, he made it practical. He experienced with it. He used it. And he came back with double. And one came back with a little more or something. And one went and hid what was given to him of God's substance. And ne it never got used. And so the king comes back and he goes, well, where's, where's my increase? Now, if you look at that just like a regular story, you're going, well, God's, God's just mean. He just got an attitude to it. You know, you know, don't be preaching to me, Jesus. You've got a problem here. <clears throat> but he's telling you that God wants increase, and the only way he's going to get it is through your decrease. And he's saying you haven't been faithful to the kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like. The kingdom of heaven is like this story. Where when God has given you something, it's given to be laid down and it will bring forth increase. It's not given to be held on to. It's not given to be hidden some way in, inside of you, you know, we say in our heart, hidden somewhere inside of us. And then we continue to live the way we do, ungiving, unblessing others, trying to get blessed, trying to... Wondered why, you know, why don't people bless me? Why don't people help me? I, you know, <clears throat> I mean, folks, there's probably something wrong if we say, why don't people bless me? Why don't people think about me? I mean, I think about others. I give all the time. I give to that person and I gave to this and I gave to that. There's probably something wrong with your giving. I'm just thinking here. <clears throat> and clearly that kind of giving is not producing an increase. You know, because it's not true selfless giving by Christ. And that's the key. It's not just giving. You know, philanthropy is not the same as selfless giving. It's two different things. <clears throat> All right, so, <clears throat> and, and in this case, the Lord, the master, the master nature was upset. He said, that's not me. That's you. Whatever you've done, it's not me. And the guy in, ends up in trouble. You know? Well, we picture this kingdom. Okay, there's this kingdom, you know, and it's got castles and it's got, you know, it's got a, a drawbridge and it's got, a, it's this beautiful, and we're all going to live in there one day. And, and I want to go and live in the kingdom of God. And, 
and all that. that's kind of what we picture in our mind <clears throat> and yet he gets the lord gets down to it and he goes well you know i see no evidence of the kingdom in you so we're going to put you in uh, in prison or whatever because that way only takes and only thinks of itself and in that case I'm, I'll just be honest with you folks he went and hid it maybe he was afraid he would lose it okay well fear okay fear I, you know he, I'm sorry I'm sure I can get in a lot of trouble no wonder you know the nations of this world shall hate you but you know fear is just a big old selfish job of the hut it's just a big old selfish blob of flesh that says you know well i can't I can't give that. I can't do that. Well, if I do that, you know, I, you know, I, let me get, let me take it out of your field so you won't feel convicted. Well, I can't go to the mission field because da 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 da. Well, I can't. You know what I mean? I mean, we we put it on some instead of just daily little things. Well, I can't. I I can't do that. But it's always considering itself. And, and is considering the damage to self, you know? I mean, can you see Jesus? Well, I can't go to the cross. Do you know, you know, I'll end up with nail scar. I mean, I, first of all, the cross is bad enough. I'll have scars in my hands and feet throughout all eternity. What's that going to look like for the guy on the throne, the guy in charge? That ain't going to look good. They beat me up. They won. Hey, where'd you get them scars? Well, they, you know, they got me. <laughs> I didn't do so good in that round. <clears throat> Jesus doesn't think like that. He goes, you know, I mean, we were talking about, my wife and I were talking about the fact that <clears throat> when I went to the mission field, I took my guitar with me. Of course, this is back, way back. <clears throat> and the guitar I took with me was a Martin D28 um, 1968 guitar. It's worth between twenty and thirty thousand dollars now. Okay, now I took that to the mission field with me, <coughs> and um, uh, people said, "You're crazy. Leave that here. Take a junker." <laughs> and I'm going, "Look, I I have to give God my best." I remember it was so hot there, and my my sweat and the way uh, you know my I guess acidic or something playing the guitar where my arm laid over it, it literally melted off the the uh, covering that they put over it. <coughs> Big place where it was just totally off of it, begin to crack and stuff like that. <coughs> um, and it got so bad that. Uh, I, and I had gotten that guitar, by the way, secondhand. The original person who bought it was Mike Gentry. And several years after he bought it, he needed some money and stuff, and I did him a favor, and he, that's what he says to this day, but I was glad to do it because I love that Martin. And gave him some money that got him out of a jam, and I had that guitar. So M Martin will honor your guitar if you're the original owner. You have a lifetime warranty on it. If you number one, if you take care of it, and if you're the original owner. Well, I just thought, well, on a whim, I'm going to do this. So I wrote because we're in Jamaica, and I wrote Martin. <laughs> I told them where I was at in the middle of an island that was, you know, way far from most of the big cities and stuff, and we had an orphanage and this and that, and I brought my guitar, and, you know, this is what happened to it, and I'm not the original owner and all this kind of stuff, and they wrote me back, and they said, send it in, we'll take care of you. And they did, and they fixed all of that. When I got back, it had a scar where they had to fix the, the front of it. They literally hand-carved out a sliver that was about this long, hand carved it to fit in there and then they totally refinished the front of it again okay but it had that scar 
underneath, but it was fine now, and it wasn't cracked. And I thought, you know, this is just like Jesus, you know? He's got those scars, and it's fine. It's actually a beautiful thing because it was used to the glory of God. Um, I mean, you've got pictures of leading the orphan. We had an orphanage, and, you know, leading them in songs and stuff. <clears throat> All right, well, that's a, you know, and I'm sorry I used an example of myself, but that was, that was a testimony to me of uh, had I been fearful, and, you know, as some of you know, that guitar ended up getting burned up later on down the road, way down the road, but ended up getting, so, so someone would go, well, you, you lost it anyway. Yeah, but I didn't lose what I had of the Lord in that whole situation. I didn't lose the Lord, and I didn't lose the opportunities for it to be the Lord. And I didn't say, well, when am I going to get an opportunity? I have opportunities all the time. Anyway, I'm not trying to do anything other than I just, I just believe that this essence that is Jesus can rule over our flesh and our souls and our fears and our all of that kind of stuff. <clears throat> All right, we're still in wow, Matthew 25, and let's look at verse uh, 32 through 34. Well, this one's self-evident. <clears throat> 32 through 34. Uh, let's go back 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, the throne of his glory. That is this glory of the selfless one. And before him shall be gathered all the nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth the sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. All right. So let's try to, try to do this short version. Let's just say, without being too noisy there. Okay, let's say <coughs> that there is, I'll put it on this side, there is a kingdom in relationship to, let's just, let's just say it like this. I'm finding it hard to find the right words. Let's say that there's a kingdom in relationship that is a, a, a physical kingdom place, okay? An actual entering in, okay? All right, so how do you enter into the kingdom? How do you be made ready for the kingdom? <clears throat> well, the king makes you ready for that, okay? So you're out here, all right? And other people are out here, you know, you got different ones, you've got sheep and you've got goats and the the circles representing those who are being conformed to the image of Christ. In other words, the king is beginning, there's a, a transition happening to them. They are transitioning out of the kingdom of this world, the square that I have drawn here, and they are being transformed into the image of his son, the circle that I have here. So in a little sense, you could say they're a little representation of a bigger kingdom that we have written over here on the other side, okay? But they're, they're still growing into that. They're growing into it. They're entering into it inwardly and being made ready for what they're going to enter into in relationship to the kingdom on a larger scale. All right. Let's use the example of the scriptures that we've got here. <clears throat> you have sheep and goats. You have circles and squares before the time to enter the kingdom as far as, again, I'm, I'm just using this as an example, kingdom as a place. Okay? You with me? All right. So, in our story, they are the picture that Jesus gave, 
there are sheep, there are goats, there are circles, there are squares, and they have not yet entered the kingdom, but they have been conformed. Some of them have already been conformed to it and are of it, and that's why they enter it, because they are of it. Does that make sense? Because what does he do? He divides, he puts a dividing line, and he says, okay, you know, all the sheep get on, uh, I'm doing the opposite here, but but on the board, that may be right for you. Let's see. Yes, for you guys, it's right. All right, so I'm putting the goats on this side, and I'm putting the sheep here. So there is already a division of the kingdoms before you enter the, the place of the kingdom. In other words, that which is, is first spiritual, and then you begin to enter into the, I don't know, I don't know what words to use, but the kingdom is first, is, is not something that you go to, not first, it's not something you enter into first, it's something that, get ready, enters in to you. And you become of that kingdom spiritually. All right. So then, let's just say, let's just put it all on this realm here. So there comes a day, I'm just saying, there comes a day where you're, sitting, you're before a throne. And on that day, he looks at you not not with a, you know, if you're a girl with a pretty dress on or if you're a guy because you, you have been a missionary all your life or, or if, you, you know, if you were a, you know, a, a, a physical therapist and ignored you know, nothing but you know, working out or something like that. He didn't look at any of that. He sees either a sheep or a goat, a square or a circle. And he goes, okay. Now, there is a kingdom we're all entering into together, but only those who are already of the kingdom can enter in the kingdom. You say, well, where do the others go? To the not kingdom. <laughs> okay. They go, there's another way of saying it. They go to the kingdom of the squares. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So, it's important that you see that, that the, the kingdom issue, if you think it's a far off thing, it's not, it's now. The kingdom of God is within you, or it's supposed to be. Well, we say, well, I'm a Christian, so the kingdom of God is in me. Well, no, it's being developed in you. He must increase. If the king is increasing, the kingdom is increasing in you. Because the kingdom really is just words out here. Uh, the reality of it is Christ ruling in that lamb nature. Sheep on one side, lamb on the throne making the decision. So he, he knows what he's after. He knows. And he knows the difference. He can smell the difference between a sheep and a goat. I mean, he's not, I mean, I'm just telling you, he's just, he's not seeing as we think, you know, well, there's this big crowd of people from every nation and go, hey, black brother, come on down, you know, like there's some sort of, you know, game show or something. No, he's looking for that nature. He's looking for where Christ has already been ruling. And if he hasn't been, if we've been putting ourselves first and our fears first and our, you know, what we want first and, you know, and doing Christian things but still living opposite of Christ's selfless nature, you tell me what's going to happen, you know. <clears throat> All right, so that was, that's, that was a good scripture there, wasn't it? That's a good one to end on. So we'll take a break and we'll come back and I'll yell at you some.